So as a cell ages, it can sometimes be subjected to apoptosis, which we talked about in the previous lecture, or uh, programmed cell death. But it can also <clears throat> not necessarily die, but decline in its ability to um, divide and enter a period of what's known as cell senescence. And so cell or replicative senescence is the period of time where a cell that's mitotic is no longer able to divide. And this happens with age. And so when um, we started to grow cells in vitro or in culture, it was originally thought that they were immortal and that they could divide forever and ever with no decline at all. And so in the 1960s is when Hayflick and Moorhead of the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia started to notice that their cell populations growing in dishes that had divided many times suddenly stopped doing so and seemed to not divide as well or as quickly, uh, they were a little bit hesitant to report those results. Because it was very well accepted that you could take a cell from a patient, put it in a dish and culture it as a primary culture, and it would remain immortal. Um, and that is not what they saw. What they saw is that there was actually a maximum number of times that a cell seemed to be able to divide in culture um, once it was isolated from a person. And this maximum number of divisions is what's now known as the Hayflick limit, uh, based on the man who discovered it. <laughs> and so one of the experiments that they did, um, Hayflick and Moorhead, to kind of solidify the idea that primary cells grown in culture have a finite lifespan is they looked at both a mixture of cells that contained uh, female cells that were relatively new to culture, had only divided 10 times, and they looked at male cells that had already undergone four rounds of cell division, or 40 population doublings. And these cells that they were looking at were fibroblasts. And what they noticed is that when you mix them both male and female cells together of different um, kind of cell ages or doubling ages, only those female cells could survive an additional 30 cell divisions. <coughs> and this was not due to some competition for nutrients within the media of cell culture. Because when you separate out these female cells that had only divided 10 times, they were easily able to survive another 30 um, rounds of doubling, whereas the male cells, um, regardless of how many nutrients they had available to them, because they were already at this 40th population doubling, did not survive an additional 30 rounds. And so the Hayflick limit of the fibroblast cells that um, Hayflick and Moorhead were working with is somewhere around um, 40 to 50 cell divisions. And what they had determined from this is that there was nothing wrong um, and with their media. It was just that the, the fact that the cells seemed to have this finite lifespan or finite number of cell divisions they could undergo in culture. And so what Hayflick and Moorhead also did was look at um, cell lines in culture. And this is a graph showing the relative number of cells over time um, for those same fibroblast cells that they were looking at in the previous experiment. And what they noticed is that in primary, in a primary culture where cells are isolated from an organism and then grown in uh, a dish later, there's a first phase that lasts several months where the period of growth is relatively slow. And that's what's known as phase one. And this is likely um, happening as the cells sort of adapt to living, not as part of an organism, but as uh, cells in a dish, right? And so once the cells get used to this, they can enter phase two, which is a rapid proliferation. And you can see that the relative number of cells increases uh, rapidly over time. And then at a certain point, um, the number of population doublings reaches that sort of 40 to 50 limit, and there's a decline in the number of cells or the cell proliferation until ultimately cell division is lost altogether. And that would be considered phase three. And so this phase three is usually what we know as the senescence portion. And it's important to remember that this is what we see for growing cells in primary culture.
Um, when we think about cell lines or immortalized cells, they actually enter into phase two of rapid cell proliferation, and then they can continue to double forever and ever. They don't actually enter into this phase three or this cell proliferative decline. And usually, uh, immortalization of cells can hap um, happens through our own manipulations. Um, but there is a chance that cells grown in culture can spontaneously immortalize, and that would lead to a growth curve that looks something like this dotted line here. And what's important to note is that there's variation in aging between each of the cells in this population as well. And so some cells in phase three may still be able to proliferate faster when put back into normal growth conditions um, than other cells in phase three. And so that variation in aging that we see in organisms as a whole exists between the individual cells as well. So when we talk about cells that have entered into senescence, which are that phase three or the decline in cell division, there are several characteristics that all these senescent cells share. And the first is that their morphology tends to change as they become senescent. They grow in size and they become larger and they may also have multiple nuclei. And so you can see down here a picture of a senescent cell on the left that actually um, has one grown in size and then two, the cell on the right actually has two nuclei. And looking at these pictures of cells here on the right, one cell is one of these kind of polygonal shapes here. And so you can see the size and shape of the cells that are considered young are still in that growth phase two in A. And then in panel B, they showed um, cells that have undergone about 30 doublings. And then C, cells that have undergone about 45, which is reaching their Hayflick limit or their maximum replicative lifespan. And you can see um, the cells that are pointed at by these arrows in B and C are actually much bigger than the other cells, um, and they vary in shape. And this is pretty obvious in panel D as well, where there's been some stain added. So there are three large cells here, one, two, three, much larger than these other cells in the dish. And what you'll notice is that there's also separation of these cells from others. Um, senescent cells tend to secrete a lot of collagenases as well as proteases that can degrade extracellular matrix and basically detach the senescent cells from a nice confluent layer of cells growing on the bottom of a dish. And so in addition to being larger and having multiple nuclei, often you'll see a senescent cell kind of on its own because it's started to degrade that extracellular matrix around it. In addition to the change in their morphology, they also, uh, senescent cells will also release a lysosomal enzyme that can degrade the sugar beta-galactose into monomers. And so there's an assay to actually observe senescent cells in culture um, where a certain compound is used that will um, basically bind to any monomers <laughs> within the cytoplasm that have been created by the degradation of beta-galactose. And so normally um, this enzyme is sequestered in the lysosome, so there wouldn't be any degradation of the sugar, and therefore the cells won't appear blue under normal conditions. But once they become senescent, uh, that beta-galactose is uh, being degraded within the cytoplasm by an enzyme that's released. Um, and then the stain is observed, it's nescent cells. And finally, there are some functional differences in senescent cells as well. Um, they decrease their DNA synthesis as well as transcription and translation rates. Um, as a cell that's no longer going to divide, they don't need those products at the same level a cell that is undergoing rapid cell division will. They increase the amount of kind of cellular junk that's around 
uh, senescent cells, in addition to secreting um, extracellular matrix degrading enzymes, will also secrete higher levels of inflammatory cytokines, and their cell cycle will become lengthened. And the lengthening of the cell cycle is um, hypothesized to be a result of a change in the molecular breaks that exist between the G1 and S phases of the cell cycle. And it seems like by lengthening that checkpoint, um, the senescent cells lengthen their full cell cycle. And so while we don't necessarily know <coughs> what controls cellular senescence at the mechanistic level, we do know that there are several tumor suppressor pathways that um, have been implicated in activating senescence at the beginning. And the first is a pathway we've already discussed um, when we talked about the cell cycle and the transition from G1 phase to S phase, and that's the P53 tumor suppressor pathway. And so if you recall, a double-stranded break in the DNA can activate P53 protein, which is a transcription factor that ultimately um, increases expression of P21, which is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor. It binds to an active cyclin, um, in, in this case, the one that promotes S phase, and it activates it, um, halting the cell cycle in G1. And usually what would happen at this point is the DNA can be repaired, and then once it's repaired, P53 will become inactivated and the cell can progress through the cell cycle. Um, in some cases, when that DNA cannot be repaired, <coughs> P53 will actually remain active, and that means that cell will stay in G1, basically arrested there, um, and enter into senescence. In some cases, however, P53 can actually trigger apoptosis rather than senescence. And how it distinguishes between when it should trigger apoptosis or cell death and cell senescence is completely unclear as well. So there's a lot to learn about how P53 um, controls senescence. And the second tumor suppressor pathway that's been implicated in at least activating cell senescence is the um, P16 pathway, which consists of several different proteins. Two of the ones that have been implicated in senescence are listed here, P16 as well as ARF. And so P16 is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor, it's like P21. It inhibits the SCDK, which promotes um, S phase from G1. And ARF is an, a protein that in, um, basically inhibits the P53 degrading protein. And so both P16 and ARF work together to prevent progression of the cell cycle. <coughs> and so you can see here, cyclin D, CDK4 complex, which is the S cyclin, <coughs> or sorry, S CDK active complex. P16 is down here. It can actually inhibit activity of this SCDK complex and stop cells from shifting from quiescence to proliferation or stop cells from G moving from G1 phase into S phase. <coughs> and it seems like some manipulations of this pathway also have a role in controlling cell senescence. And by upregulating P16 as well as ARF, um, the cells can constantly inhibit SCDK, which would inhibit movement to S phase and proliferation in favor of senescence. But what, um, to, what <coughs> contributes to the idea of um, senescence versus just quiescence, or sort of waiting for a potential mitogenic signal to trigger proliferation is not known. And so ultimately, there's still a lot to understand about the mechanisms controlling cell senescence because they do remain relatively unclear. And some have argued that understanding these mechanisms is not super relevant to understanding aging in an organism because most cells in a eukaryotic organism are post-mitotic and therefore are not going to undergo cell senescence. And so <clears throat> to really understanding these mechanisms is more important for understanding tumorogenesis and cancers um, and diseases of aging, but not necessarily aging itself, um, at least from an organismal context. <clears throat>